Okay, thank you. I'd like to thank you for inviting me. I've learned so much this morning that I spent part of the time also wondering why I'd been invited because I, I really um, feel an outsider at one level to this field. And what I decided to do today was to show you how I go about cognitive development because I'm not uh, dealing with a social area very much and then show how that might be extended to the social domain in some work we've been doing recently. So um, what I want to do is um, talk about some work I've been doing for, for quite a long time looking at cross-syndrome comparisons um, and argue that it's better to compare syndromes where there are similarities rather than compare a syndrome to the normal, um, typically developing child. And um, the other thing that um, I find very important is to trace domain-specific cognitive level deficits back to their domain-relevant basic level deficits in infancy. And this will be a comparison between Williams syndrome and uh, Down syndrome. The second thing is to extend this kind of analysis to the social domain. And this is work that is ongoing. I don't have uh, really any results to tell you about, but how we will go about it. And this is to compare infants at risk of autism, Williams syndrome, Down syndrome, and comparing low versus high SES. And again, make the argument that when we compare deficits that are close together rather than to the typically developing child, we get a handle more subtly on what's going on. So I want to present first a study that we've been doing, which is infant sensitivity to um, number in two syndromes that both have attention deficits. And under the domain-specific interpretation of, this, um, uh, of these two syndromes, we get a very neat double dissociation um, between Down syndrome and Williams syndrome. And this, of course, is for any um, person working on adults, is a very exciting outcome. And what I want to show you is that there's another interpretation of the same data. But let me tell you first how um, we discovered the double dissociation. So we've been studying number in infants with Williams syndrome and Down syndrome, both of whom end up with atypical number development, although Down syndrome are better than Williams syndrome in the long run. And what we do is we habituate um, or familiarize um, infants to pairs of objects, each time a different pair, a different type, and then we change the number and we see whether the um, infant orients for longer to that number. And in this case, what we found was that the Williams syndrome infants were perfectly like um, normal controls, they could discriminate um, small exact number, but the Down syndrome infants were very impaired. We replicated this later with dots, the same kind of thing, uh, familiarizing to two and changing to three, or familiarizing three and changing to two, because this is what the um, typical uh, development literature had been doing, and again we found the same result. The Down syndrome were far worse than the Williams, and the Williams looked like typical controls. We then went on to look at large number discrimination. So here we're looking at numbers that can't be counted or individuated. Eight dots changed to 16, or 16 dots changed to eight. And this is something that seven, six to seven month olds can do when there's a ratio of one to two. If it's a ratio of two to three, they take a little longer. And again, we tested our Williams and Down's infants, but this time we got the opposite pattern. The Down syndrome infants were able to make the discrimination. The Williams syndrome infants were very impaired which I show here. So, in principle, we have a double dissociation. In Williams syndrome, small exact number is intact, large approximate number is impaired, and in Down syndrome, it's the opposite pattern, small exact number impaired, large approximate number intact. Okay, it seems very clear. There's a cross-syndrome double dissociation. We have two separable numerical subsystems. It seems to be innately specified because these are genetic syndromes and maybe even genetically determined. So the genes, one or more of the 28 genes on chromosome 7 in Williams syndrome, contribute to a domain-specific deficit in the approximate number system and spare the exact number system, and we have the opposite pattern in Down syndrome. But, and this is where I want to take these data and give a very different kind of interpretation. The previous one was an interpretation very much inspired by adult neuropsychological models, and the one that I want to propose is a developmental um, uh, perspective. So first of all, 
double dissociation, spared and intact, are really very static notions. If you spare something or preserve something, it doesn't take account of dynamic change over time. And that's why I think these kind of notions are completely inappropriate for d neurodevelopmental syndromes, which are very dynamic, as is typical development. The second is that the infant brain, in the infant brain, we know that specialization and localization of function are very gradual. The infant doesn't start, off, start out with very highly specified neural circuits that are tuned precisely to different parts of, um, of the cognitive system. In initial um, development, there are a lot of cross-syndrome um, interactions. So syndromes and, uh, sorry, cross domain interactions. So domains are not isolated one from the other, as might be the case in a mature brain that's become specialized over time. But there's a lot of um, cross-domain interaction. So my argument is that we must trace these cognitive level deficits back to their much more basic level domain relevant processes in infancy. So one of the questions we had was, maybe the differences between Williams syndrome and Down syndrome for number, this area, this domain of cognition, might not be specific to number at all, but might be due to differences in visual attention and visual scanning patterns, because we knew that there were dif um, difficulties in both syndromes in visual attention. So we've done several experiments now, too long to explain in the short time I have available, um, that looked at visual circade pl um, planning. And what we have found is that in Williams syndrome, we find very impaired planning of visual saccades. So they find it extremely difficult to just even react to um, a stimulus that is pre presented and move their eyes quickly. They stay fixated. Um, whereas in Down syndrome, they're very proficient at moving their eyes around the environment. Their problems lie in the opposite, in sustained attention. They find it very difficult to stay sustained on a stimulus. So our hypothesis was that scanning large arrays, the brain focuses on global quantities, and that might be the case for why Down syndrome do well. And scanning small arrays, the brain focuses on individual objects, in fact fixates on individual objects, and that might be why Williams syndrome are um, succeeding on these tasks and failing on um, large arrays. So we looked at um, the scanning patterns with eye tracking of the infants with Williams syndrome and Down syndrome. I just want to give you um, a couple of examples of the scanning patterns. So this is a typical infant with um, Down syndrome, and as you can see, they've moved their eyes around the whole of the array. By contrast, an infant with Williams syndrome stays very much fixated on a few of the objects that are displayed. We see a similar pattern with um, large quantities. Again, the Downs infant is moving not on everything, but getting a good sense of there are a lot of things on this display, whereas the uh, Williams syndrome infant is again very focused on just a few. So, Williams infants then are very impaired at, plan uh, impaired at planning their eye movement saccades. And what I want to look at is what kind of effects that might have on a developing system. So first of all, it certainly leads to problems with discriminating large number. But the question that one wants to ask as well is, is this deficit domain relevant to other developing domains? Can we see other impairments in the system where the planning of saccadic eye movements has impacted? And the answer is yes, um, and we can look at it in face processing. But first, the typical view, the popular view of Williams syndrome is that face processing is intact. They do very well on standardized face processing tasks, and number is impaired. And this is true across many labs. Nobody is denying that they do extremely well on face processing. And this has been explained by some in terms of the dorsal stream being impaired in Williams syndrome and the ventral stream being spared. Um, but we were asking, could the visual saccade planning deficit be domain relevant to both number and face processing? And therefore, the, the deficit would explain both the impaired and the proficient performance. And that, in fact, the genetics of Williams syndrome can be used to explain not only what's impaired, but also sometimes what is shown to be proficient in the syndrome. <coughs> 
So we've done various behavioral experiments showing that Williams syndrome focus on features when they are um, analyzing faces. So unlike typical development where the configuration is used and there's rapid um, processing of the distances between the different features, in Williams syndrome, the processing is much more featural. What about the brain? Well, we also looked in earlier work at Williams syndrome using high-density ERP, and we compared human faces, animal faces, and cars. And what we found was that in Williams syndrome, because of the featural processing and the way they go about processing faces, they actually did not specialize, their brains did not specialize for faces in the way that um, typical development uh, does, despite their very good behavioral scores. So if we look here at the healthy controls, we see for human faces and monkey faces, we see a clear N170, um, the marker of the structural encoding of a face, and a very different pattern for cars. But in Williams syndrome, we see no such differences. So first of all, the N170 is very small, followed by a, a big P2, but there's no difference at all between the processing of cars and the processing of faces. So in Williams syndrome, despite their good behavioral scores, they are failing to specialize for um, faces. And we see the same kind of thing if we look at um, processing of upright and um, inverted faces when we look at the scalp maps. In the healthy controls, strong lateralization um, to the right for upright faces, bilateral processing for inverted faces, and a strong statistical difference here, which is not found at all in Williams syndrome. There's a failure to localize as well. So proficient face processing in Williams syndrome is underpinned by different cognitive processes, a much more featural process, and different neural processes, a lack of specialization over developmental time. So how can we explain the proficient face processing in Williams syndrome? Well, some have argued that it's due to an enlarged fusiform face area, because the FFA is indeed enlarged. So what I want to suggest is that we make a very clear distinction between the developed brain and the developing brain. So true that the FFA and the um, Williams syndrome adult brain is unusually large in proportion to the rest of the brain, the whole brain is smaller. But there are two interpretations of this requiring a developmental approach. One is that the large FFA causes the unusual face processing proficiencies in Williams syndrome. So that's the brain to behavior. But a quite different explanation is that the unusual focus on faces in infancy, and we know from other research that infants focus heavily on faces in infancy, influences over developmental time the enlargement of the um, fusiform uh, face area. So this is much more a dynamic view, a very different one from this in terms of what happens over developmental time. And what I want to suggest is that we can go even further. We know that for Williams syndrome infants, and I think this is probably true in utero, we've still got to test this, there's heightened processing of auditory stimuli. This is true of autism, by the way, as well. That means that when the child is born, they're going to focus on mother's speech. They've heard mother's speech for three months or the last three months of, um, in utero life. Speech, of course, is contingent with mother's face. So they orient to mother's face. They have problems with disengagement because they can't plan rapid eye movements the way um, other babies can. This leads to a fascination with faces, and over developmental time, this leads to an increase in the um, fusiform area compared to the rest. Now, whether or not this um, uh, analysis speculation is right, um, seems to me to be um, um, secondary to the idea that we need always to trace things back right to the very beginnings of, uh, that we can and to look across different domains as they interact over time. So early in Williams syndrome, there's this deficit in the domain relevant processes of saccade planning. What could that affect? Well, if we look over time, and we know this from other research, first of all, it makes 
di uh, attentional disengagement, very difficult, and in uh, Down syndrome, the opposite holds. We have a focus on local spatial features in spatial tasks. We have a featural processing of faces. This leads to poor triadic um, attention. When the mother points, they don't follow the points. Um, they're very um, poor at pointing. And um, poor large number, as we saw before, but good at small number because they can focus on um, individual objects. So there are cascading developmental effects over time on several emerging um, higher level cognitive systems. There's an int uh, I've several implications of this for intervention. First of all, it should be syndrome specific because Williams syndrome and Down syndrome have a very different pattern in terms of their um, uh, attention problems. One has a problem with disengagement, the other one has a problem with sustained attention. It should start early in infancy because if this analysis is right, then what is happening very early in infancy is impacting over time on different um, cognitive outcomes. But above all, we don't need necessarily to train in the domain of deficit that we have um, identified. We might train, for instance, in Williams syndrome in saccadic eye movement planning. And we've got some work going on at the moment with contingent movements on a screen as the baby looks across um, um, the screen. In Down syndrome, we might do exactly the opposite and train them to keep their attention um, focused. Um, and this, in principle, should have... Sorry cascading effects on different um, domain-specific outcomes in the long term. So in the last few moments of my talk, I just want to show you how we might extend this to the um, um, social domain, which I haven't normally worked on before. And this is um, a, a, an attempt at the moment that we're doing with a student to compare infants who are at risk of autism with infants with Williams syndrome. And you might say, well, surely those are opposite profiles. And indeed, to some extent, you're right. They are, their genetic backgrounds are very different. Multiple genes of small effect, 28 genes, four of which we now know have large effect. Phenotypically, um, children with um, uh, autism are aloof and dislike looking at faces. Those with Williams syndrome are extremely friendly and fascinated by faces. Children with autism interact with objects preferentially. Those with Williams syndrome prefer people. Spatial tasks are far better than language in autism. Language is far better than space. So why would I compare them? What I want to suggest is that cross-syndrome associations are actually um, a richer way to look at developmental um, uh, questions. So it is also true that both Williams syndrome and um, um, infants with autism have difficulties with rapid eye movement planning. They both have problems with attentional disengagement. They both are, have atypical eye gaze following. Both have atypical pointing in development. Both have atypical triadic act, uh, attention, atypical face processing, and both have um, uh, atypical amygdala and OFC circuitry. So I believe that cross-syndrome comparisons might reveal better the time course and more subtle deficits if the starting points are similar and then they diverge over developmental time. So what we've been doing recently is joining up with a group who've set up a study, a longitudinal study of baby sibs of children of families in which a child has already been diagnosed with autism using a huge range of different um, approaches. And we've been asking are the results of this study syndrome specific to autism or do they also um, show similarities with infants with Williams syndrome, Down syndrome and more recently we've been comparing low and high SES infants. The point of doing this is that every time we get a result, so we have results that are beginning to um, come forth showing that for instance um, resting state EEG in the frontal area of uh, the gamma um, um, band is atypical in um, infants with autism and infants with Williams syndrome. We're still waiting for these results. But we also find it in infants of six months who have low SES. Now, we can look at this now across many different areas of the brain and compare the different infants when we've um, used exactly the same um, 
set of, um, of tests that will allow us to make these um, finer comparisons than if we're just comparing with typical development. With typical development, the differences are always very stark. When we compare much closer we're, we're, when we're looking at um, impaired um, development, I think we may find um, much more subtle um, differences. Okay, so what I'm arguing is that compared to typical development matching, cross-syndrome comparisons may actually reveal more subtle differences and the time course of change. And we've seen that in the number case, and we're now looking at it in, in the social um, area. It allows us to ask questions like which processes are syndrome specific, which are syndrome general, which are modality specific or modality general. We find sometimes that there's an impairment, say, in, in, um, in children, slightly older children, we found an impairment only in the um, visual domain in Williams syndrome, but in both the visual and the auditory domain in autism. We can also ask, are the cognitive and neural processes different even when the behaviors start out in, to be very similar? And over time, we can ask about compensation or compounding effects of similar deficits earlier on and follow these developmental trajectories over time. So, what I've tried to do in this talk is suggest to you that there's a very um, big difference between static and dynamic questions when we're looking at um, human development. The static questions which are frequently asked are which modules are impaired, which are intact, which region of the brain are they in, um, located, how are the syndromes dissociated, and which genes or set of genes map to the domains of deficit. But much more dynamic questions are how do cognitive level outcomes originate in infancy? How do neural circuits change over time? Is there compensation or compounding effect of deficits? How are syndromes dissociated or associated? How does the environment interact with gene expression? And we have a lot of work now that I couldn't put into this short talk um, showing how um, change occurs over time in what genes seem to be affecting um, cognitive outcomes. And do the mutated genes also contribute to proficient domains? I think there's always been a tendency to look at deficit and do the mapping there, but often the proficient domains are actually hiding deficits underlying them that can be mapped also to the genes. And above all, the question will always be, is there a developmental explanation um, compared to the adult one? Thank you. <laughs>